My name is Kelly Sandman Hurley. I own the Dyslexia Training Institute along with Tracy Block Zaretsky. We're both the co founders. We provide professional development online for anybody who's interested in learning about dyslexia. We train people in the Orton Gillingham approach. We offer advocacy, um, one on one tutoring, and diagnostic assessments in the San Diego area. We have three learning centers there. And I also write a lot about special education law and dyslexia for, for a blog online. So some of the myths are that it's a vision problem, and it's not a vision problem. It cannot be corrected by colored lenses or overlays. It cannot be corrected by any kind of vision therapy. If vision therapy does correct the problem, then it's not dyslexia. There's a common misconception that it's motivation. So a lot of teachers will blame a student for not being motivated enough to read that day or not being motivated enough to spell something correctly. Um, there's a common mix, misconception that um, you see B's and D's backwards, and you don't see B's and D's backwards. You just have trouble placing that phoneme onto that grapheme and then figuring out what it is fast enough to make that decision. Um, there's a common misconception that it's a hearing problem or an auditory processing problem, which is different than phonological processing. Those are the main myths of dyslexia. Um, there's a myth that it happens more in boys than girls. It's definitely not true. There's a myth that... Um, you can outgrow it, definitely can't outgrow it. Once you're diagnosed with dyslexia, you have dyslexia for the rest of your life. You can learn to live with it, you can overcome it, but you can't outgrow it. When a teacher um, initially determines that a student might be struggling, what usually happens is they will pull them aside and put them in a reading group. And so they will just start to do some things within the classroom to help that child with reading and not really bring attention to it to, usually they won't bring attention to it to the parents or if they do, they'll do it in a very casual way. They might say that your, your son is struggling a little bit with reading, but it's okay. You know, we're just going to do a little bit of extra reading and, and it'll be okay. And then at the end of the year, the parent gets a report card and the child isn't reading and, and it's a surprise to them because the teacher has said he'll be okay because he's getting into this reading group. And so what's happening is um, the teacher may find out, this well-meaning teacher will find out that the student is struggling and then just let it wait another year. And just they may tell this, the, um, the parent that he'll just grow out of it or she'll just grow out of it. And that doesn't happen, so we've lost a year that could have been used for intervention when the child is, you know, their brain is the most plastic and we have that window of opportunity for them to learn faster. And so we've lost that year and then the parents are left with what to do next. For the most part, teachers and teacher training programs are getting zero training in dyslexia. So when they get into the classroom, they've taken five or six courses to get them ready for teaching, and none of those courses have touched on dyslexia. There may be a, a day or two where they talk about an hour or so about dyslexia, and then, and then that's it. So that, that's the teacher training program. And then the reading specialist programs, they're getting maybe um, two sessions on dyslexia, and that's it. But they're not getting training on how to, like again, how to identify them and then how to intervene. And what can be done is that universities can begin to realize that this is causing a problem in the classrooms and begin to um, implement some type of instruction for those teachers before they go into a classroom. At the very least, the master's degree students and the resource teacher students and anybody who's about to be a special education teacher should have much more awareness and instruction about what dyslexia is at the university level when they're in training. Before a teacher approaches a parent with the possibility that their child might have a reading problem, I would, I would encourage them to have information with them that they can give the parent so that they're not just telling them something in passing, that they, they make it a really thoughtful conversation. They have a meeting. They give them resources and say, these are some symptoms. And this is what it really means. I, I'm not diagnosing anything. I'm just saying that this is a concern I'm having. And here's information. Here's resources. Here's a website you can go to. It's just, it's just I just want to bring it to your attention. So make sure that you're giving them information instead of just kind of doing it casually. My, my advice for parents who've just found out that their child has dyslexia is to take a deep breath and realize that there is help for their child. That their child will learn how to read when they're given the correct intervention. I would also like to express to parents that it is not in any way their fault and I would like to express to their, their children that it's in, in absolutely no way their fault either. But it's never too late. So no matter if they find out their, children has, their child has dyslexia at 15, there's still help, there's still intervention, there's still things they can do as if they had found out their child had dyslexia at seven. So no matter what, where in the age 
spectrum they are, they can still get help for their child. And it's not a hopeless situation by any means. And in fact, once they do get that intervention, everything changes. The child changes, the school experience changes, the, the family dynamic changes because that stressor is gone now that they know what is going on. So and that, that brings me to the labeling of dyslexia. There are, um, you know, there's some conversation that labeling can be bad, but in this case of dyslexia, labeling can be extremely freeing and liberating because it's taking the pressure off the parents of any guilt that they may have done something wrong and the child that they're dumb or that they can't get it or that they'll never learn. So when they finally know what's wrong, they can move on and get the intervention that they need and it changes everything. Um, in the discussion of talking about students with dyslexia and, and talking about labeling them and assessing them, we need to be very careful to remember that not every reading problem is dyslexia. So when we are looking at a child with a reading problem, we need to, to look deeper, dig really deep and make sure it's not a lack of educational opportunity. Maybe they moved around a lot when they were children. Maybe they missed some school because of an illness. Maybe they had, um, did not have a literacy rich environment from zero to five. So you have to make sure that there aren't things that are missing from a child's early educational experience that are causing those problems. So a child with dyslexia is somebody who is has an unexpected reading disability. So this is somebody who had a literacy rich environment from zero to five that went to school consistently, that's had good teaching consistently, and they're still not reading as well as we would expect them to read. So you have to really make sure that when you are, before you diagnose them, before you label them, that you are really doing due diligence and figuring out what the core problem is of their reading problems. The other people that should know what dyslexia is are pediatricians, um, psychologists who do testing, school psychologists, parents. Um, I, I would advocate that preschool teachers or at least directors in preschools get a little bit of education about early signs and symptoms of dyslexia. Um, judges should know what dyslexia is. Um, anybody who is dealing with somebody who may have developed a behavior problem, to be able to go and delve a little bit deeper and see if there's something causing that behavior problem. If it's school failure, what's causing that school failure? A lot of times people will be diagnosed with something that's a result of a reading problem, but the reading problem is being missed because it's being overshadowed by the behavior problem. So I think anybody who is dealing with a child who may be experiencing behavior problem because of school failure which could be judges, pediatricians. Pediatricians are my, my number one people that should learn about it, as well as um, college professors. The college professors in undergraduate programs should realize that they have students in their classrooms who have dyslexia, and they need to be more open to the accommodations for kids in college. So when a child says, I need more time on a test, a college professor needs to be more open to why they need more time. It's not that that student is asking for less work than their peers. It's not that he, they're trying to make it uneven or get, get an unfair advantage over their peers. They're just trying to even the playing field with more time. So um, these children do go to college and they do need more time in order to process information, but that's just evening the playing field. It's not creating an unfair advantage, which is something that a lot of college professors believe that it is. Accommodations are really important for students with dyslexia because they need to be able to access the information that they're intellectually capable of understanding. So if you have a child who's in fourth grade who's reading at the second grade level, but they can understand everything that's not, in, that's not written at the fourth grade level, their accommodation is going to allow them access to that information while they're getting an intervention. So as long as they have the accommodation to get that information that, they're, that they can handle at fourth grade, they just can't read it, that is just evening the playing field for them and allowing them to get their education in a different way. So an accommodation like a book on tape or a textbook on tape so they can listen to it instead of reading it is, is just giving them access to the curriculum that right now they don't have access to because they can't read it. So books on tape, speech to text, because writing is so difficult for people with dyslexia that if you're able to speak into a computer, you're gonna get their thoughts. Instead of saying, um, I went on a trip, they might talk about this wonderful camping trip with the rising moon and the flowing river. And instead, when you ask them to write it, it's gonna come out as, I went on a trip. 
But if you're letting them use speech to text, you're really evaluating what they really know, which is what we're trying to evaluate in school. What do they really know versus what can they write? So that's what an accommodation will do for that child, is allow them to show you that they know the information. One thing that children with dyslexia will learn along the way is that if they go like this enough, like, I don't know, I don't know, or if they don't answer the question, somebody will give them the answer. Instead of that person giving them the time to process the question that they need in order to give them a good answer, they will learn that someone will just give them the answer and they can move on. So the processing time is really important for a child with dyslexia outside of the reading and writing, just asking questions, just giving verbal directions, um, asking them to go left or right. They need that time to process what the question was, and then they'll give you a good answer. But you also have to teach them to give themselves that time to process. Because like I said, they're going to learn along the way that they, you want an answer immediately, so I'm just gonna give you an answer immediately, but we need to teach them that you need to think about it first, and I'm going to, going to allow you to think about that question before you give me an answer. A lot of conditions that can exist with, con with dyslexia are dysgraphia, which is a difficulty with writing. So it may be poor handwriting, and it may just be difficulty spelling or getting your thoughts down on paper or organizing your thoughts on paper. It can be both. And then also many students with dyslexia also have ADD, ADHD, and some executive function issues as well. Many students with dyslexia will also struggle with math. They may have trouble remembering their multiplication tables, their division tables, their addition, their subtraction. They may um, mix up what the sign is, so if it's an addition sign or a subtraction sign, and they might not pay attention to that. What where it really impacts them is when they get to the word problems because they have trouble with their reading. So that's when they will really be impacted by the math. Um, what happens too is the directions on top they have trouble reading those directions, so that's my, that might also be why they're missing some of those math problems. And also, they're missing the vocabulary because they can't read those math problems because they're having trouble with reading. So it really does affect their math. Okay, so an individualized education program, otherwise known as an IEP, is what a student will get once they are determined that they're eligible for special education services. And what an IEP does is it identifies what their need is, what their present levels are, and what the goals are for the following year and how they're going to achieve those goals. So those are, then it gives them the services. So what an IEP does is it's a program so that the school knows what the child is going to be doing for the entire year in order to to achieve the goals that are identified in the IEP. And what a 504 plan does is it's just an accommodation. So if you have an IEP, you don't need a 504 because those accommodations are listed in your IEP. So if you just have a 504, you don't have an IEP. So what a 504 does is it gives the child the accommodation. So this is the more time on tests. This is not, not marking off for spelling. This is using speech to text software. Um, taking a test in a different room. Those are accommodations. They're not actually getting an intervention from a 504. So many parents might choose a 504 over an IEP because they're getting an intervention outside of school. So instead of doing an IEP, they'll just do a 504. If the child does not qualify for, education, for eligibility for special education based on the school testing, they may offer a 504 instead. But what parents don't know is they, they can disagree with the testing from the school. So they can say, I disagree with that testing. I don't agree with the fact that he doesn't need special education services. Therefore, I'm requesting an independent education evaluation, which is called an IEE that the school can um, accept and then they pay. And the, the parent can go outside and get an, an independent evaluation and then bring that back to the meeting and then determine whether or not an IEP is needed. So the parents can disagree with the fact that the school has decided they don't need an IEP. What's really common when you get into an IEP meeting and you start writing the IEP with the IEP team is what they'll do is they'll start writing the goals. And what parents really need to remember, and educators and anybody involved in the IEP process really need to remember is that needs drive goals. So if the student has needs in fluency, phonological awareness, vocabulary, reading comprehension, and phonemic awareness, then there should be five goals. Instead of putting them all into one goal or saying, oh, they don't need fluency right now, that's just absolutely not true because they need all five of those in order to be able to become a good successful reader. So goals in an IEP need to be taken really seriously and written in direct response to their needs. So there should be a goal for every need. So if there are 10 needs, there are 10 goals. And that's really, really, a st I'm a stickler for that because that's important. 
If that's the only thing the school is held responsible for is what are those goals. So if they don't write good goals, the school's only responsible for the goals that they wrote. You can't go back and say, well, he didn't learn this and that. Well, they weren't in the goals and you agreed to it. And you don't really have a whole lot, a whole, a lot you can do about that. I think it's really important that parents know that they are part of the IEP team and that they can call a meeting anytime they want. They can ask the IEP meeting team to come together and talk about their child's current IEP at any time they want. They have a voice in this process. So I always tell my parents that when they're coming to an IEP, just remember you know your child better than anybody else in this room. So if anybody in the IEP team says something about your child that you don't agree with, you need to tell them what you think about that. And you need to tell them what you think about their IEP meeting. You are the most important part of the IEP team and they need to know that they have the rights to be there and be part of that team and make these decisions without feeling pressured. That they don't have to sign anything when they're at an IEP. And if they're feeling pressured or they're feeling um, outnumbered, that they should consult consider having an advocate come with them or a family member or somebody that can take that emotional strain off of them and help them with the IEP because it's very emotional to be in an IEP for your own child. Thank you.